Hello, hello everyone. I have one of the most important teachings I have ever done. Now I know you love the prophetic. I love the prophetic. But let me tell you about the prophetic. The prophetic is just hearing, a, hearing the voice of the Lord. It's just about hearing his voice. And of course, prophecy does three things. It comforts, it builds up, it encourages. So what I'm about to share with you today is a teaching from the Word of God. But it's a teaching that is so powerful, I just know, I know that I know that I know that it, it will touch a nerve, it'll touch some place in you that you didn't recognize because that's what it did in me. So I'm gonna just start out sharing the story. I was sitting in my easy chair just a couple days back. My husband came home and he handed me a magazine, Saturday Evening Post. See the picture of the buffalo on it? So my husband and I have been to Yellowstone National Park many, many times. The buffalo free range, they run all over Yellowstone National Park. And you have to be very careful of them because, you know, they casually stroll across the highway and you have to stop your car. And so anyway, we love buffalo, which are actually called bison. That's the proper term, bison, not buffalo. But anyway, he found the magazine. He was excited to give it to me. So I just started strolling through the magazine. Lo and behold, um, I see this little article and I feel compelled to read it. So I'm gonna read this article to you. It's very brief, but just follow me because you're, you're gonna get this. I'm gonna change the names and I'm gonna change the name of the airport because I don't wanna have any legal ramifications. But anyway, the title of the, the article is called You Be the Judge. And so, this author writes this story. This is an actual story. This is in a, re this is in a recent issue. So, okay, I'm going to talk fast just to get through the article. In January 2013, Mr. Miller, an architect in his late 50s, arrived at the Pittsburgh International Airport on his way to Miami to run a half marathon. In his carry-on bag, Mr. Miller, carrying running gear, a laptop, computer, power bars, and inside a short PVC capped at both ends, a heart monitor and a watch. Not surprisingly, the TSA agent working the x-ray machine noticed the pipe, prompting a secondary screening overseen by a TSA supervisor, Mr. Brown. During this time, Mr. Miller was asked if his bag contained any organic material. Not knowing agents were referring to the power bars, Mr. Miller said no, thinking organic meant fruit or vegetables. At this point, Mr. Brown, the TSA agent, demanded to know why Mr. Miller did not mention the power bars. Mr. Miller said he misunderstood and suggested agents be clear what organic matter entails. After waiting 30 minutes, for agents to manually examine his carry-on luggage again and again, Mr. Miller told Mr. Brown that he planned to file a formal complaint against him for being disrespectful and aggressive and then asked for the correct form in order to file the complaint. As Mr. Miller exited the screening area, Mr. Brown called the airport police, and reported that Mr. Miller had made a bomb threat during the screening. Within minutes, Mr. Miller was taken into custody, placed in a holding cell at the airport police station. Early the next morning, he was charged with disorderly conduct, threatening placement of a bomb, and making terroristic th uh, threats. His wife picked him up after arranging his $40,000 bail. At the trial, Mr. Brown, the TSA agent, testified that Mr. Miller was belligerent and physically aggressive during screening and had threatened, quote, I could bring a bomb through here any day I want and you'll never find it, end quote. Mr. Miller denied making any bomb threat and accused Mr. Brown of 
fabricating the statement in retaliation for filing a complaint. Mr. Miller maintained that at all times he was patient and not agitated, but claimed Mr. Brown was agitated and argumentative throughout. There were no witnesses to Mr. Miller's alleged statement, but airport video clearly showed that Mr. Miller had been calm and reasonable throughout the screening. While Mr. Brown appeared highly agitated and aggressive toward Mr. Miller. After viewing the video and considering Mr. Brown's inconsistent testimony, the judge acquitted Mr. Miller of all charges. Mr. Miller later brought suit against Mr. Brown, the Pittsburgh Airport, excuse me, the Pittsburgh Police, Airport Police, the TSA, and the Department of Homeland Security, alleging numerous federal and state violations. Though most were dismissed because of sovereign immunity, Mr. Miller's First Amendment retaliatory prosecution and Fourth Amendment malicious prosecution claims against Mr. Brown were not. Mr. Brown appealed to the U.S. Appeals Court to reverse the lower court's decision not to dismiss the claims against him. The court ruled in favor of Mr. Brown, the TSA agent, finding that TSA airport screeners cannot be sued for retaliating against travelers exercising free speech under the First Amendment because the role of the TSA in securing public safety is so significant that we ought not create a damages remedy in this context. The dangers associated with aircraft security are of real and high consequences. The court commented that it was up to the Congress to arrive at proper remedies in these situations, not the court. So this incident happened in January of 2013 and the court's final decision was in 2017. Okay, so I read this article, I'm revved up, I'm angry and I'm like, oh my gosh, what an injustice against this poor man. All he wants to do is go run a marathon Unfortunately, he puts his things in a pipe that are, that are perceived as maybe some kind of bomb. He's very calm. He doesn't curse the TSA agent. He doesn't act out. He doesn't get angry. He's not huffing and puffing. But the TSA agent, who's obviously very aggressive and very angry, um, lies and says that um, he calls the security and police and says that this man made a bomb threat only because Mr. Miller said he was going to file a formal complaint against the TSA agent. So I am like, I am like enraged inside and I'm like, this isn't just, this isn't right. This, this TSA agent, he should have been hung out to dry. How dare him lie? I mean, he lied about the man, he lied, he perjured himself, he um, bore false witness against the man, um, and you know, he, he wanted to get back at this guy when the guy said he was going to, when Mr. Miller said he was going to file a formal complaint against him. So I was enraged that he gets off scot-free, scot-free, nothing happens. The judge, you know, lets it go and says, no big deal. Now, fortunately for Mr. Miller, uh, all the ch charges were dropped against him as well. So that was fair, but was was unfair is that he had to spend time in jail. He had to spend a night in jail. He had three charges leveled against him. Those were serious, serious charges. Um, the one charge was that he had disorderly conduct, was, which was not true. The second charge, threatening placement of, of a bomb, which he did not do, and making terrorist threats, which he did not do. And lastly, he had to spend $40,000 to post bond, to get out of jail. That's what the TSA agent caused him because of lying, because of false witness. So I was livid. I was just, I was so worked up about this guy. I thought, this is like, this really isn't fair, okay? So like, is there justice today? Does justice really, really exist today? Well, after I go to bed at night, 
I'm lying there. The Lord brings this whole story back into my mind. But then, he doesn't just bring the story to my mind. He brings a scripture to my mind. He brings Matthew 5, 25 and 26, which I'm going to read to you. Jesus, these are Jesus' words. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never liked that scripture. I'm not sure I really even understood that scripture. Like, what does that really mean? Why, why would I agree with my adversary for fear I'm going to be put in prison and then I'm going to have to pay every last penny? I mean, it just didn't make sense to me. But that's the scripture, Matthew 5, 25 and 26, that the Lord immediately brings to my mind about this situation because I was all revved up about it. And the Lord systematically takes me through the scriptures in my mind and shows me that I am wrong about the TSA agent. So here's what I want to teach you. Here's where Mr. Miller went wrong. Mr. Miller, I'm presuming Mr. Miller is not a Christian. Doesn't sound like he is, but who knows? Okay, so He's good because he doesn't curse the man, he doesn't yell, he doesn't get upset, he doesn't lose his temper, he's patient. He, while they go through his stuff for 30 minutes trying to, you know, trying to find that he's got a bomb somehow, he stays calm. He doesn't retaliate with his words. Here's where he failed. When he looked at the TSA agent and said, I am going to file a formal complaint against you because you were aggressive and disrespectful to me. That's, that's when everything changed. And that one little statement caused him all the harm he experienced. That one statement, I'm going to file a formal complaint against you. And then all hell broke loose three serious charges, he's in jail overnight and has to pay $40,000. If he had just kept his mouth shut, kept on going, he could have flown to Miami, done the marathon, and everything would be square. But this thing went on, dragged on for four years. So you're talking attorney's fees, you're talking aggravation, you're talking about, you know, going over and over in your mind and just carrying the burden of, of all of that um, angst and, you know, who knows all the feelings that he had inside toward that TSA agent. I'm going to teach you something about the scripture. So Jesus says, Agree with your adversary. I just turned over here to Romans by mistake. Agree with your adversary while you are on the way with him. Quickly. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Lest this adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. And assuredly, Jesus says, assuredly. In other words, for sure, I say to you, you're not going to get out of there till you've paid every penny. Now think about the story I just talk, talked to you about. All right. In the Old Testament, we were subject, well, I didn't live during the Old Testament, but the people of that time were subject to the outward behavior. So don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't lie. It was outward behavior. They were judged by their outward behavior. 
But Jesus comes along, and it's a whole new ball game. And he hasn't even gone to the cross, but he's already teaching a principle. Now, if, if you had done this in the Old Testament, who knows what they would have done to you. But Jesus is saying, We're, I'm going to judge you by your heart, like what's in your heart. I'm going to judge you not by your outward behavior, by, but by your heart. These are heart issues now we're going to look at, okay? And even Jeremiah confirms that. In Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 33, this is Jeremiah speaking on the Lord's behalf. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So Jeremiah is prophesying, prophesying um, about the new covenant that Jesus is going to write with his blood. And, and Jeremiah is saying, these things now, these laws, these commands, they're, they're going to be written on your heart. And they're going to be written in your mind. And um, so then Jesus makes this statement, agree with your adversary quickly. Now, let's look at what that means. I'm going to just hang on a minute here. So adversary, agree with your adversary, is an opponent. Anybody who's your opponent. It can be an opponent in a lawsuit. It's an enemy, especially Satan. Quickly, agree with your adversary quickly. Agree with your enemy, your opponent quickly, which is speedily, without delay. So think about what Jesus is saying. Agree with your enemy quickly, without hesitation, without delay, while you are on the way with him. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean while you're walking with him or while you're on a journey with him. It means it's just a, it's, it's a way of saying it's a course of conduct. It's a way of thinking, feeling, deciding. In other words, agree with your enemy at the time of the situation you're currently experiencing. Mr. Miller is currently experiencing this TSA agent giving him a bad time. Mistake. Instead of looking at him and saying, I'm gonna file a complaint against you, he should have said, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood about that. I didn't mean to um, cause you to mistrust me. I didn't mean to mislead you because I had this stuff in a PVC pipe. I'm just on my way to run a marathon. So you agree with your adversary at the time of the situation you're currently experiencing. You agree with them while you're thinking, feeling, and deciding to do otherwise. Because in your carnal mind, in your natural mind, you're going to do what I did. You're going to get mad, and you're going to think out of your flesh, this man did me wrong. He did me wrong. But just agree, just be cordial, practice instant reconciliation. See, he had an opportunity right there. He had an opportunity to practice instant reconciliation with Mr. Brown. Quickly, Without delay, agree with your adversary. Understand that conflicts cause much greater damage to relationships when left unresolved. 
understand that conflicts cause much greater damage to relationships when left unresolved. So think about all the damage that took place between these two people. Four years. Four years that, that could have been resolved in an instant. Quickly, Jesus said. Quickly, agree, quickly. Suddenly, without delay, get it over with. Take care of it. Reconcile quickly. See, we have to love by choice, not by circumstance. Remember to overcome evil through love. So now I want to look at Romans because this is, you know, if I'm going to teach you something, I'm going to teach you out of the word, not, not what I think. I'm going to teach you what the word says because the Lord spoke to me through the word. Uh, Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 9. He says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. I'm going to jump down to verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, and um, Paul is going to now quote, he's going to quote out of Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head do not over be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good repay no one evil for evil as much as possible live peaceably with all men don't avenge yourself don't give place to wrath vengeance is the lord's he'll repay not you but I love this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Because when you do so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. And we don't let evil overcome us. We overcome evil with good. So what do you think Mr. Miller could have done to resolve this even better for himself he could have given the TSA the agent the power bar power bars he could have given him some small gift maybe that he had he could have just touched his arm and said bless you I appreciate you for doing such a thorough job I'm glad that you wanted to make sure that I wasn't some kind of terror agent you see he missed a golden opportunity. Because he felt justified to seek vengeance and file a complaint to harass the man and make the man pay. So he wanted to make the man pay. But the Lord says, vengeance is mine. He wanted that man to pay for what he had done to him, put him through all of that nonsense for nothing but because he made the decision to try to repay the man evil for evil, guess what happened to him? He gets put in jail, spends the night, $40,000 later can get out of jail, lawsuit, lawsuit, and then eventually loses the last lawsuit. Four years of aggravation that he didn't have to endure. Lawyer's fees, he didn't have to endure. $40,000 richer and a less a jail cell. If he had just agreed with his adversary quickly while he was in the midst of the circumstance, because Jesus said assuredly, you're not going to get out till you've paid the last penny. So, 
the Lord really took me to the woodshed about that, really showed me. My whole thinking was so carnal, so worldly, it was hostile to the Word of God. My thoughts were not in alignment with the Lord's thoughts. My thoughts were way out of line, way out of line. You see, when you think like the world and you think according to the world's standards and what the world says is justice, you and I both, I mean, we would agree. There's no doubt, first of all, there's no doubt that what they did to Mr. Miller was unjust. It was an injustice what they did to him. But had he not filed the complaint or threatened to file the complaint, he wouldn't have had to endure all the rest of that injustice, which was much worse than 30 minutes waiting while they scoured through his things and his bag and kind of harassed him. So injustice, yes, we're all gonna face injustice, but what are you gonna do about it? Are you gonna repay evil for evil? Are you gonna say, well, I'll just take this in my own hands and I'm gonna make sure this person I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to write them up. I'm going to write them up. I want the boss to make sure he knows what this person did to me, how unjust they were. They lied about me. And on and on and on. You and I have all been in situations and circumstances where these kinds of things have happened. So, my flesh my carnal mind went in the wrong direction and the Lord had to redirect me. My ship was off course, so to speak, and he had to right the ship because my thinking was wrong. My thinking was not lined up with the word of God, not one bit. Now I wanna share with you, before I close, I wanna share with you something very interesting. I know that that scripture from Proverbs about heaping coals of fire on the person's head when you do them good. If they're hungry, you give them food. If they're thirsty, your enemy, you give them something to drink. Therefore, you heap coals of fire on their head. People have wondered forever and ever, what in the world does that mean? And then Paul repeats the scripture from Proverbs. Well, in those days, you know, most of the people walked around with baskets on their head and that's how they carried food, water, but they also carried coals for fire. When you think about it at that time, they would have needed coals. They would have needed live coals for a fire to keep um, warm in the home. And they would have needed live hot coals to cook with. So a person actually carried those hot coals on their head. And um, if they saw a neighbor who was in desperate need, you know, they, they saw that their fire was about to go out and they had coals on their head, they'd give them a few coals of fire. And that was showing the person an incredible kindness because, gosh, if you have no fire to make food or no fire to keep warm, that's a pretty desperate situation to be in certainly at those times. And, um, and so this person would give some live coals and meet the desperate need of the neighbor or individual. And so he would be heaping coals of fire from his head to this individual. So that's where that comes from. I think that's so interesting. I love that because um, now it makes it real to me. I understand. So, Mr. Miller missed the golden opportunity to heap coals of fire on Mr. Brown. And he could have done that so easily with just a few words. You know, like I said, he could have given him his power bars or maybe, you know, some little gift that he had or just putting his hand on him and thanking him for the job that he does and did do that day and being very assiduous about making sure that Mr. Miller wasn't some bad terrorist. I know for me, 
the Lord, this was such an incredible lesson. And you know that the Lord, since this, brought up another situation to me. Showed me another situation where I was feeling like I was justified in doing something not justified, okay? We just have to live according to God's word. And Paul is so clear. I love those scriptures that he gave us in Romans 12. They're so powerful. And I don't know about you, but I want to live according to the word. I don't want to live by my carnal mind. I don't want to live by my flesh. And sometimes it's just so easy to, to shift right into that flesh thing and start thinking like the world. But you know, Romans 8 says that a carnal mind is enmity against God. And what that really means is it's hostile. So my thoughts, when I was thinking all those bad thoughts about Mr. Brown, my thoughts were hostile to God. They were hostile to him. And I don't want my thoughts to be hostile to God. So I repented quickly. As soon as he brought it to my attention, I repented quickly. And I just think it's a powerful lesson for us to learn. Um, certainly, I've always struggled with that, agree with your adversary. Like, Lord, what in the world? But he quickly showed me this story, and that was it. And I've always struggled with that, heaping coals of fire on somebody's head. And uh, so I hope that this has helped you. And I really believe that not only is this a teaching, but it's a word of wisdom. It's a word of wisdom from the Lord to those of you who have been in situations where someone has done something very unjustly to you. Now you have an opportunity to heap coals of fire on their head. And it says the Lord will reward you. Amen. I trust you were blessed with this. And I hope that you can share this story with many other people. Um, you know, use this teaching. Use it for yourself. Teach others. Share it. Because um, we want to help the body of Christ. We want to we want to go, grow strong in our faith and grow strong in the Word. So I just bless you and love you and can't wait to be back with you again.